Hero. What comes to your mind when you hear that title? A superpowered individual saving the world from a terrible evil? Or maybe a soldier who puts his life on the line by fighting in a foreign country? Or perhaps you think of the ones who are touted as our everyday heroes firemen, policemen, healthcare workers. Firemen risk their lives to save others, very often from dangerous or even life threatening situations. Police officers' duty is to serve and protect the public, and healthcare workers save and preserve the lives of individuals and their loved ones using medical science. Healthcare workers are often overworked, overstressed, and tasked with taking care of too many patients at one time. We entrust with them the care of our loved ones, our children, our spouse, our parents, and even our grandparents. And more often than not, we expect them to provide the best possible care. But what if that wasn't the case? Oh, she's in jail. Don't worry about it. It's over. It's not over. We as the victims are not weak. I'm, we need care. And that doesn't mean we don't matter anymore. I'm not condoning anything she did. But if respect had been given to her as a person, what happened wouldn't have happened. She cried for help many times, and none was given. On August 11, 2007, James Silcox, age 84, who was a World War II veteran and father of six, died while in the Carescent Care long-term care home in southern Ontario. This death initially raised no red flags, so the coroner denied an autopsy. On December 22nd of that same year, 84-year-old father of two, Maurice Granat, also died at the Carescent Care home. His death raised no red flags. On October 14, 2011, 87-year-old Gladys Millard died, and on October 26, 95-year-old Helen Matheson died. A few weeks later, 96-year-old Mary Zawinski would also die, and in the summer of 2014, 90-year-old Helen Young would die while at the Carescent Care home. And in March of the following year, 79-year-old Maureen Pickering would meet a similar fate. And towards the end of the summer, at a care facility in Meadow Park in London, Ontario, 75-year-old Arpad Hovath would also die. All deaths would raise little to no red flags. Some of the deaths were spaced out. Almost all of the individuals who had passed away were older, and almost all had underlying health conditions. The deaths seemed explainable, and in some cases even expected. But all of the individuals mentioned had another thing in common. At the time of their death, they were at the same facility as one nurse, Elizabeth Wetlaufer, one of Canada's worst serial killers. Elizabeth Wetlaufer was born on June 19, 1967, and obtained a bachelor's degree in religious education counseling from London Baptist Bible College, and then went on to study nursing at Kitchener's Conestoga College. She then worked for Christian Horizons, which was an evangelical organization that helped support people with developmental disabilities. Christian Horizons' vision is to see people with exceptional needs belong to communities in which their God-given gifts are valued and respected. The vision for Christian Horizons began shortly after the birth of a baby boy named Stephen. Stephen was born with a developmental disability. In 1965, his parents, Reverend Jim and Adrian Reese, felt God's call to connect with other families and explore options for children with disabilities. During the inevitable recounting of her crimes, she would allege that at certain points she felt she was being directed by God, who would tell her who it was she should kill. In 2007, Wetlaufer would be hired onto the staff at Carescent Care a long-term care home in southern Ontario, Canada. While there, 
Despite initially coming across as professional and caring, she would go on to have issues with alcoholism and substance abuse, and be suspended multiple times for medication-related errors. One of those medication-related errors would eventually result in her termination from the Kerrison Care Facility in 2014, with the facility citing the reason as a pattern of behaviors that are placing residents at risk. Her termination letter went on to say, You have an extensive disciplinary record for medication-related errors, which includes numerous warnings as well as one, three, and two five-day suspensions. During her time at Kerrison Care, she would kill seven people by injecting them with insulin. There were also others who she injected with insulin who did not end up dying. An injection of insulin can cause the blood sugar levels to drop dangerously low, causing hypoglycemia. This can lead to a brain injury, a coma, or even death. After her termination from Kerrison to Care, Wet Lawfer then went on to do in-home care and work at other long-term care facilities, such as the Meadow Park facility in London, Ontario, where she injected Arpad Hovath, age 75, with insulin, killing him. And as we mentioned in the beginning of this video, the death of an elderly person with pre-existing medical conditions staying at a long-term healthcare facility is likely to not raise any red flags, meaning, if Wetlawfer was careful enough, she could go years without being caught. And she did. Her killing spree ran from 2007 to 2016. Within that time, Wetlawfer admitted to killing patients with insulin multiple times to multiple people, almost all of whom took little to no action against Wetlawfer or made any reports to authorities. A sponsor from Narcotics Anonymous who she confessed to said that they didn't believe her because they felt she was a pathological liar. An ex-boyfriend who she admitted the killings to attributed her confession to a psychiatric episode. She even told her pastor, who prayed over her, told her she could be forgiven by God's grace, and said that if she ever did it again, they would have to tell police. The College of Nurses of Ontario, or CNO, who was informed that she was fired for putting the life of a patient at risk nearly two and a half years before Wetlawfer was officially charged, didn't even make an inquiry until after Wetlawfer was charged in 2017. Wetlawfer eventually enrolled in a drug rehabilitation program at the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health, or CAMH, in Toronto on September 16, 2016. It was there that she confessed once again to staff regarding the killings. They then reported her to the CNO. Shortly thereafter, Wetlawfer resigned as a registered nurse, writing in her own resignation, I, Elizabeth T. Wetlawfer, am no longer fit to practice as a nurse. I have deliberately harmed patients in my care and am now being investigated by the police for the same. That same day, she called an investigator and had the CAMH facility fax over a four-page written confession where she describes her urge to kill as a red surge which overtakes her. With each kill, she notes feeling a sense of euphoria. She went through this lengthy written confession with an investigating officer in the span of over two hours in an interrogation room. Now just a few disclaimers before the confession video begins. First of all, since Wetlawfer is speaking to the police voluntarily, is cooperating fully, and throughout her confession rarely holds anything back, and the document they'll be using as an outline for this discussion is a four-page written confession by Wetlawfer, the officer in this video takes a role that less embodies the spirit of an interrogator and is more akin to that of an interviewer. Therefore, you will see a noticeable lack of classic interrogation tactics, typically used to try to reveal evidence, try to trip someone up, or trick them into revealing information or contradicting themselves, and more straightforward questions like, what did you do here? Or how did that make you feel? Or what made you want to do these things? The second thing of note is that since this is a confession and not necessarily an interrogation, the information being presented is fairly straightforward and for the most part can be taken at face value. That being said, her actions, her reasoning, and her demeanor are inherently compelling on their own, and therefore require much less interpretation, interruption, and analysis. I will trim out the parts where they're simply going over the same information again and again, or areas where they talk more about procedural matters not directly pertaining to the crime. If you wish to see the entire untrimmed two and a half hour long confession, it's linked in the description below. I will be stopping the interrogation periodically to point out interesting things regarding Wetlawfer, the interrogator, and their conversation. Sorry about that. That's okay. Too many people moving and shaking around here. You can't really keep track of who's doing what. So, um, so yeah, like I said, um, 
I'm just going to go through for everything in this room is audio and video recorded. First right. off, you okay, okay with that? Oh yes. Okay. So I just want to go through, like I said, a couple formalities, cover a few little things off, things that I have to do on my end that I, I, I right. need to do, and uh, things that I just want to tell you and make sure that we're all on the same page before we uh, before we get going. Okay. Okay. Um, but but before we get into that, I just want to kind of get an idea of, of your career and and where you kind of where you've been in your career and um, kind of how you got into things and. Registered nurse. I started from call. I started from with from uh, here in Park uh, Secondary School. I um, <clears throat> I graduated grade thirteen, won three year of law school. Not law school, sorry, journalism school. Okay. And uh, then uh, went to uh, Bible College, yeah. London Baptist Bible College in London. Graduated with a degree in uh, counseling, with a bachelor's degree in counseling, mm -hmm. and then um, discovered that that's not going to be, wasn't really going to get me a lot as far as work-wise and career-wise, and so I went back to uh, here in Kirk High School for a year, and I took a year of math and sciences. Um, so as far as your latest position at um, St. Elizabeth. Yeah. That was your last position as a RN, is that yes, correct? Yes, it was. Okay. Yes. And you said you resigned from there? Yeah. Okay. What, what brought you to that? That's, that, that's where things get a little crazy. Okay. This is part that I haven't told the doctors. Um, Because it seems so stupid now. When my ex and I broke up in 2007, I was already taking the medication for my, for my borderline personality disorder. And I was so angry. And it was like a voice said inside me, I'll use you, don't worry about it. And the different times that I have caused people's deaths or caused them discomfort through the um, through the insulin, I believe it was the influence of that voice or whatever it was. It wasn't a voice in my head, it was a voice in here. And when I would do it afterwards, I would hear like a laughter in my chest. So, I started working for St. Elizabeth, and I was doing well, but it was a lot of pressure. And the way that, you know, that I've helped people to die has been through insulin. And uh, after my first, my 30-day evaluation, my uh, my uh, supervisor came to me and said, you know, I'm really sorry. We want you for Woodstock, but we have so many kids in the schools in Ingersoll that need help with their insulin pumps that you're going to start working in Ingersoll. And I've had nothing since. Okay. And I know that the doctor, uh, Dr. Kahn, provided with Prescription that yeah, and he up. also gave me two lots of teens, yeah. and was very strict. I am not to take them until all the interviews are over, because they will start to interfere with my thinking, okay. and then that to the interview. Yeah, exactly. And do you feel that you're about a clear sound mind right now? Yes, I do. Conversing with me in this, in this room? Yeah. Okay. And, and everything that you're telling me is, is the truth and the best that you can remember? Yes. Yes. Um... I could, I can appreciate where you're coming from as far as the work that you you went through. Um, obviously, I've never been a nurse, and I've never worked in, in the profession that you that you did. But I could imagine how overwhelming it is. Yes. Yeah. Um, having a lot of responsibility, uh, maybe not having the support of, of the administration or your, or your supervisors. You know, just kind of go out and get it done, right? Yeah. And uh, and that could be. I could see how that would be stressful, and I could see how that would drive you maybe into your addiction and into other things. But um, I want to just go over this document, if that's okay, okay with you. Yeah. Okay, would you be willing to do that with me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you, 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 you do your thing. Sorry. No, no, don't be sorry. Absolutely not. This is pretty, excuse me, major. 
I've only ever had parking tickets. I've never been arrested for anything. Well, like I said, you're not under arrest right oh, now, I know. but it is, uh, it is a very significant investigation you're right. I understand. Okay. And like I said before, Beth, I, I do appreciate you uh, speaking with us. And I can imagine that, uh, does it feel like a weight off your shoulders? Yes. So yes you've been yes. carrying a burden for quite some time. And I've tried to get help. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Sometimes it takes a few attempts to to finally commit to it, right? Yeah, I had a pastor that I told him he prayed over me and told me I'd be fine. And that was God's grace and then When was that? That was uh Halloween two thousand and thirteen. Okay. Yeah. And you, you kinda of told so what had happened to your to you at, to that point in your life with yes. involving these people? Yeah. Okay. And where was that? That was here in town. Okay. Do you want his name? If you want his name, it's up to you. Oh, no, sorry, it wasn't... Did I just say 2014? Mm -hmm. It was 2013. Okay. All right. So, so be before we get into this, um, I know that there's a statement which we have and that I've watched where you attended the police station in Toronto at yeah. 52 Division, is that correct? Yes, that's okay. correct. And I honestly, I think it was Detective Hamilton and I honestly can't remember the other detective's name but now. I know it started with an A. Um, and you met with them for, uh, uh, I, I was going to say about an hour and a half. That was nuts. <laughs> yeah. And at that point, you had in your possession um, a photocopy of this document, yes. right? Okay. And you went through and you read it out. Yes. Okay. And then following that, they started uh, with the first name on the list, and they wanted to just try and get a little bit more detail of yes. of, of the involvement in each circumstance, okay. each death, right? Okay. That's what I'd like to do today, and just get some more detail. Okay. Okay. So. It's a long list. It is. It is, but I think that to you and I, I think we can get through it together. Yeah, I'm and, sure we can. As long as you're patient with me. I, I've got all the time to look. I'm not going anywhere. Because I'm physically comfortable. It's a nice chair, but... Yeah. Well, anytime enough. you need to get up and wander around, if you, like I said, if you want to take a break and uh, have me leave and just kind of stretch your legs and whatever the case may be, you go ahead. Okay. okay. If you have to use your washroom at any time, just let me know. All right. Okay? Because like I said, I'm I'm here as, as long as we need to be. Okay. Okay? And I'm not pressuring you to uh, to stay any longer than you want to, but I think that... Uh, I think if we just kind of sit down and go through this, like I said, we'll get through it together. Yes. I'm, uh, I'm a pretty patient person, and I'm here to just listen to what you have to tell me, okay? Okay. Okay, and like I said, I, I appreciate it. Okay? So, um, how about we just do this together? I'll just bring this over okay. here. Is that okay? Sure. Okay. So, I, I'm not going to have you read through this entire document, because I've already ha you already did that, right? I have written it. I have read it. I have, you know, lived it, so. Yeah. Absolutely. So, Mr. Silcox. Yes. Okay, September of 2007. Yeah. Okay. He's the first one that died as a result of what I did. Okay. And, and before you get into that, you have signed some kind of page numbers, all that kind of stuff on yes. the documents. So, we'll just go in order of, of how you've written it, okay? And I know that the detectives in, uh, in Toronto kind of had this in their possession and just kind of got you to recall some things. Yeah. Um, I, I'm just going to keep it here because. I mean, you've already written this out, so yeah. what's on here is we already know that. Um, I just have some follow-up questions as, okay. as, as with regards to each circumstance. So, Mr. Silcox, um, it says here you were working at a double shift uh, from 3 to 7, right? 3 p.m. to 7 a.m. Right. Okay. And this was at Crescent Care? Yes. Okay. In Woodstock? Yes. Okay. And tell me about your, your knowledge of, of James and, and your daily interactions during a shift with him. Um, I didn't see him every time. He wasn't always my patient. I just knew from what uh, people had said that he would grab the, the nurse's uh, breasts and buttocks and he would say horribly inappropriate things about his wife that now he was there, you know, um, he was going to fuck all of us. She was going to fuck all of us, Doc. And, this would say the correct things, and he did touch me inappropriately once. And where was that? On, on my your breast. On your breast. Okay. And were you alone in the room at that point? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, did he have a roommate at all? Did you have a roommate? I, he must have. He wasn't in the same room. 
Lastly, it was either in a double room or a quadruple room. Okay. Would you remember any other residents that would be roomed with him at that time? Or? No. No. Okay. No. That's okay. Um, what portion of the home would, would, was James in at this point? He was in the okay, there's an east wing, south wing, north wing. He was in the north wing, mm -hmm. so halfway down, and he was either in a double bed or a quadruple bed. Okay. All right. And um, the, the diagnosis of his, of his health at the, at the time you were caring for him, do you remember? He was post hip surgery and he had dementia. Do you remember how old he was approximately? No, I don't. I didn't see his face. In his 80s? Yeah. Okay. And, sorry, he was not a diabetic? Not a diabetic. And, sorry, you said he had dementia? Yes. Yeah. Okay, which you've also noted here as well, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So tell me about the night. Uh, was this the first person that you did this to? That I, that I tried. Well, there were other people that I did it to who didn't die. Prior to James? Prior to James. Okay, and he's the document on here? He's the first one who died. Right. Back here? But there's some other... People who didn't die. Right, so I can't read that first name. I so it's Adriana. Adriana. Okay, so that was, I mean, they're both September oh, 2007, but that was yeah. before James? Yeah. Okay. So was this your first attempt at, at overdosing these people on insulin? Yes, Quetilda was. Just Quetilda. And I didn't really want her to die. I just, I don't know, I was just angry and um, had this sense inside me that she might be a person that God wanted back with them. Okay. And is that that feeling you're referring to that you had in your stomach yeah. sometimes? Yeah. Okay. Is that is that the point, and I hate to get off to a topic here, but the point where you had these feelings in your stomach and almost that laughter after it happened, yeah. is that the part that you didn't tell Dr. Khan? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to be clear on that. I told him about the laughter in my stomach, but not the feeling that this might be the person that God wants. Okay. It's your feelings, right? Mm hmm I honestly felt like God wanted to use me. And he kept Dr. Khan kept asking me, Do you think God chose me for a special purpose? I kept saying no. Because that did not sound like a special purpose. You know? Yeah. So but yeah, I just had a sense after my marriage broke up that God was gonna use me for something. And then after a while I started to really wonder after some of the murders, mm -hmm. if it was God or if it was the devil fooling me. Mm -hmm. Did you feel like you were doing the right thing for these people? No. No. I felt like I was doing what I was supposed to do, but it wasn't what was right for them. It's easy to dismiss whatever explanation an individual gives in an interrogation room as to why they committed the crime as fabricated, or perhaps just a way to escape punishment or create an excuse. Some suspects go as far as beginning to set up an insanity defense during the interrogation, as some of you may have seen highlighted and analyzed in other videos. It isn't uncommon for a suspect to begin blaming voices in their head, an unseen being, or the devil for the actions they committed with the motive, of course, of creating the narrative that they were insane and shouldn't be held fully accountable for their actions. Here, Elizabeth Wetlofer is saying something similar. She alleges that at one point she felt as if she was chosen by God, or perhaps the devil, to kill certain patients, patients that he wanted her to kill. The difference here, although it's impossible to know for sure, is that there's a much higher possibility she's legitimately telling the truth. She has very little to gain from this, as she's already made a four-page written confession and is voluntarily speaking with police. In addition, multiple times prior to her making the confession, she attempted to confess to friends and even her pastor, all of whom didn't believe her or didn't take her seriously. She would also then go on to waive her right to a preliminary hearing and confess to all charges in court. Um, so James, then, um, it was an evening that this one took place, right? Yeah. Um, Says here at about 9:30. Yeah. Run me through. About 9:30, I gave him a dose of uh, 50 milligrams of insulin. He's not not diabetic, so I went into it. I used a borrowed insulin pen, borrowed insulin, and gave him an insulin shot. And at 3:30, the PSW. Well, throughout the night, he was yelling out, "I love you" and "I'm sorry." And not to not to me, but just you could hear him calling out in this room, and that's what he was calling out. Mm -hmm. And then at 3.30, the uh, PSWs came to me and said that he was gone. Okay. So, 
I did what we're supposed to do. I went and listened to his heart and stuff. Called the doctor. Called the family because that's what they wanted. Family came in to sit with him for a while. Doctor came in and uh, said that his cause of death was from um, an embolism due to his uh, post hip. He'd had a he'd had hip surgery. Doctor ruled that embolism due to post hip surgery. Um, who do you think he was talking to when he was yelling, I love you? I thought it might be his, his family. Okay. I really did. And when they came in and talked to me, they wanted to know if he'd said anything. Right. So I told them that I was so ashamed. Yeah. So ashamed. Yeah. When you were speaking with the family? Yeah. Okay. And is that the uh, the family that kind of commended you for the work that you had done? And yes, and that I've been there for him. Yes. How does that make you feel? Awful. Absolutely awful. How did you deal with it? Um, I just went home and went to bed. You know, I felt awful. Maybe I fought with my girlfriend. Did some exercising, you know. Yeah. Played some games on the computer and just tried to forget about it. Did you have a, uh, have a problem sleeping that night at all? Or, you know, um, or did you? Well, I was working nights, so I was... Um, you were during the day then? Um, I would say I tossed and turned a bit, yeah. Felt pretty bad. And I didn't want to see the family again. So I tried to make sure I wasn't working when they came to pick up his stuff and I wasn't. And what room? Do you remember the, like a room number or just like you No, said it was down in our phone. The wing, yeah. Okay. When you in, where did you get the insulin from for James, for Mr. Stilcox? You said you had taken some insulin. Um, and where did you get those? The insulin was kept in a fridge. In the medication room. Okay. We had two medication rooms. Okay. And so it was kept in the fridge in the medication room. And uh, extra pens were kept in the drawer. So you could just say somebody you had someone admitted and you needed a pen in a hurry. Mm-hmm. So you just put the insulin in the pen and, and put the needle on and dial up the dose and give it. And how was that documented to know that, so the Crescent Care would know that you were taking that? Insulin. They didn't keep track of insulin. Okay. So it was just uh, something that was available for the nurses' use when they knew that it was appropriate for the certain patients. Yes. Now each patient has their own insulin. Right. And maybe somebody noticed, somebody may have noticed that a lot of insulin was missing if a lot was used, but I was always careful to use different people. Okay. Different people's insulin. Insulin, yes. Okay. And Mr. Silcox, then where where did you inject the insulin into his body? I'm not really sure. I'm going to say his arm or his uh, torso. And did he know what was going on at that point? Not really. Was he uh, was he a verbal patient? Like could he could converse oh, yeah. with you he, and communicate? He didn't really converse. He did a lot of yelling out. I don't really remember him reacting when I gave it to him. So he didn't react. I I don't remember him reacting no. Would he maybe just think it's a, a regular portion of his day and Probably. receiving the medications that he, he so required? Probably, yeah, he might just. Okay. Yeah. Her and the executive director, Brenda, I don't remember her last name. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm probably going to task out for the Julie. That's fine. And here, Elizabeth Wetlaufer farts. She floats the air biscuit, dispatches the bottom bird, lets out the one cheek squeak, the cheese, breaks wind, fires the butt bazooka, just like she warned she was going to do moments ago. Putting aside the inherent funniness of flatulence, especially during serious moments such as a confession to multiple murders, there's a scientific reason why an individual who's under a great deal of pressure or stress in a specific situation might pass gas. One reason is that during intense or stressful situations, individuals tend to breathe more rapidly and take in more air. Once this extra air becomes stored in the body, it gets released, resulting in gas. The human digestive tract is also very sensitive to changes in stress, mood, or anxiety. Confessing to multiple murders in an interrogation room to a police officer would be fairly high on the list of things that can increase stress. This can cause gastrointestinal issues, such as a buildup of bacteria, which can cause gas and bloating. So, as far as Mr. Silkox goes then, besides what you were feeling in your stomach, 
and besides that you thought that this was a purpose that you were given on from your relationship for after breaking up with your husband, right? Yeah. That you, that you, he, you indicated that he wasn't a very nice man. No, he wasn't. Did, is that a portion of um, what happened? I don't know. Okay. I wonder if that's a portion of how I chose him. Mm-hmm. And afterwards I did feel a release and a release. Mm-hmm. Like a release of pressure. Okay. Because throughout this document, and, and as we go through it, a lot of these people, you kind of describe them as, as not very nice people. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I'm not sure if that's a tendency or a, a pattern that we see as far as, is that why you chose these people? Yeah, I'm not, it might be, but I also know I just felt like they were the ones. Right. I had a feeling inside that they were the ones. Before, before you injected insulin to Mr. Silcox, was it a spur of the moment thing? Had you thought about it then? Uh, when you reported for duty at 3 o'clock in the afternoon? Um, I started thinking about it about 6 at night, I think. Okay. And do you remember who the pronouncing doctor would have been? No. Like how, did that, how did that process work? That process, the way it worked was a uh, person found with no vital signs. Nurse goes in with a stethoscope, mm-hmm. listens for one minute, if there's no heartbeat, no uh, lung sounds, nurse goes and calls the doctor on call. Oh, what would that been? I guess I'm using the royal we. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> okay. So would that be just a decision that you were trusted um, to make? No, there's a there's a form okay. on the computer, and you go down through it. And if it says if you take off anything that says yes. You know, notify the coroner. Okay. All right. But you would have clicked off those boxes yourself? Yes. Okay. So obviously, knowing that you had done this to Mr. Silcox, did you feel that you wouldn't click yes so that attention wouldn't be drawn to you? You know, I honestly can't remember if he was a coroner case or not. Okay. He might have been. Now, with insulin... I it would... I, even though I did this... Actually, three people, because they believe James stroked out as well. So. Mr. Silcox. Mr. Silcox, yeah. Okay. Okay, um, November 2011. Mm-hmm. Mary Zerwinski, is that yeah. how you recall uh, her last name being pronounced? Yeah. And this was at Crescent Care? Yeah. Okay, and you said that she wasn't a diabetic, but she had dementia? That's right. Okay. But she could talk and communicate a lot. Mary could? Yeah, she was, she was uh, feisty. Was she? Yeah. She didn't hurt the nurses or anything. She was just very outspoken and feisty. And one night she said, you know, I'm going to die tonight. Mary said that? Yeah. And I said, oh. And she said, yeah, why don't you get me into the, why don't you get me into the deathbed so I can die? And I said, are you sure? And she said, yeah, put me to bed. I'm going to die. So I said, okay. And I went to the other nurse that was working with me. And uh, she said, oh, okay, well, let's put her in the side of the care room if that's what you want. So we did. And then I thought, well, she she must be the next one. Mm-hmm. I had a feeling inside of me she must be the next one. Because she was saying she was going to die, but there was no signs she was going to die. So I gave her an overdose of insulin. And she became palliative and she died. I think it's been a couple of days. There is something inherently fascinating about watching a serial killer recount their crimes in such a procedural manner. Void of exaggerations or excuses, the facade of who they were pretending to be has completely fallen away, and all that's left is the reality of the crimes they committed. And they express that reality with such an emotional neutrality, it sounds as mundane as if someone asked them what they were picking up at the grocery store. Okay. Yeah, so she's said and I stopped me, what you need to know about here, but, um... Which one has the vodka in it? <laughs> no answer from him. Um, so... I think. And can you just... Well, besides the actual obvious, uh, in the uh, title of the, the actual drug itself, long-acting and short-acting, what was the biggest difference between the two? One... One drops your blood sugar right away, the other um, starts working through your body and 
dropping it gradually over long periods of time, but it just keeps dropping it. Okay. And what would the combination of those two do together? Uh, Did you know much, or? I didn't know for sure, but I figured it would be much stronger than just the short acting. Right. Okay. Which makes sense. Yeah. Okay. You would know more than I would, but... Um, do you remember where you injected Mary? Uh, probably her arm. In her arm. And I told her, I told her it was for her pain. And do you know if she was in a single room or a double room? Well, we had moved her from the double room to the uh, palliative care room. Right okay. in her corner from the nurse's office. So where did you inject her? In the palliative bed or in her? In the palliative bed. Okay. And she, she had vocalized to you that she thought that she was going to die that night? Yeah. So I thought, okay, she must be the one. When I gave the insulin, I got that feeling inside in the laughter. Has she ever said something to, like, something to you before about wanting to die? Not like that. No, she was like, I want to die, I want to die, I want to die tonight. I'm be in bed, I'm going to die. And that was new to you? Yes. Do you remember what ship you were working? Afternoon, 3 to 11. And about what time do you think you would have moved her into the pallet of bed and, and um, Might have been after supper, so about seven. And Mary ever dying to harm you or no. upset you in any way? No. Okay. Not she was fun. Okay. She was, so she was funky and, and outspoken. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you remember being present when she died? I don't think I was. And therefore, probably wouldn't be a part of checking the boxes. No, no, I didn't do the boxes for her. Who was there to see Mary on a regular basis? Who came to see Mary? I don't know. No. I don't know. Do you know if she had family? Um, maybe a son, but I don't know. She frequently yelled out, help me nurse. She frequently yelled out she wanted to die. She just was not happy with her life. She would wheel, wheel around in her wheelchair saying, help me nurse, help me nurse, help me nurse, help me nurse. And when you went to help her, what do you want to help with? Nothing. Get away with me. Go away. Help me nurse, help me nurse. Didn't want to eat, didn't want to drink. Very difficult to deal with. Um, constantly would yell out. And or we'd say, what do you want help with? I want to die. Why can't you help me die? I want to die. And one night, it was like something snapped inside, and that red surge came back, and I thought, okay, you will die. So uh, I gave her a shot. I came up to her and said, this is for your pain, and I gave her a shot of long acting or short acting, and she started to settle down. And then um, later on, we put in, her in the bed, and I gave her more off, more of the... Uh, Insulin, I think it was long acting. She had a seizure. She turned red. She um, was diaphoretic. The PSWs called me to the bedside. Um, I took all of her vital signs and I pretended to take her blood sugar. She said, and said, oh, it's normal. Don't worry about it. How did you go about that with people beside you? Their PSWs. <laughs> Don't, no, don't let anybody see that part of the... PSWs? The, no, but what I mean is, what I mean by that is PSWs, nurses sub, nurses focus on the meds right. and treatment. Okay. PSWs focus on, like, they were busy. They were busy washing her. They were busy changing her. They were busy dealing with the fact that she was having diarrhea. They were not doing the part of the job I was doing. Right. So they never would have noticed. Where's my burger? Although, as we have already discussed, Wetlawfer's confession is candid and comes across as honest and genuine when expressing her views and perspectives on why she did what she did, throughout her confession you might notice a few similarities that she takes time to point out regarding her victims. She claims that quite a few of her victims had expressed to her, some on multiple occasions, that they either wanted to die, felt like they were going to die, or appeared to be about to die. On the flip side, other individuals who she killed she would cite as being bad people, abusing nurses and staff, and in general being disrespectful and rude. Whether or not these claims are true, we'll never know. In reality, this might be Elizabeth Wetlofer's way of coming to terms with what she did in her own mind and psyche. 
she might reason that the individuals who she killed were old. They expressed to her that they wanted to die, and perhaps in some twisted way, maybe she was doing them a favor, or serving some higher purpose. And on the other side, she might have made similar psychological reasonings regarding the victims who she deemed were bad and abusive. Although this is slightly different from the justifications, inner dialogue, and motives of other, more notorious serial killers such as Ted Bundy, Eileen Warnos, or Ed Kemper, it's a justification for killing all the same. Why, I guess you call it the breaking point of why you stopped. Yeah. Was the possibility that you were going to have to be dealing with kids? Yes, that's right. Right. Yeah. Is there anyone else within your career path that isn't listed on these four documents or these four pieces of paper that you'd be responsible for their deaths? No, absolutely not. And if we were to tell you that we've come across some fairly significant or suspicious uh, deaths at other nursing homes, where it's in? Right. What would you say to that? I'd say it was me. So there's no one else involved? No. Um, that was fell victim to your actions? No. Um, Here is one of the only times you'll see the tonal shift from the officer from interviewer to interrogator. They're closing in on the end of the four-page confession written by Wetlaw for recounting her crimes. The officer here uses a subtle version of the file technique, also known as the dossier technique in which the officer alleges that they have more information regarding the suspect's crimes that would imply that lying would be pointless. He alleges that they have evidence of more suspicious deaths at nursing homes where she worked, and suggests that those suspicious deaths could be linked to her. Wetlawfer, however, immediately denies it. Just, just repeat to me again the people that you've disclosed this to besides myself tonight. Okay, um, the very first person I ever disclosed it to was um, another girlfriend at the time, her name was, that was after I killed a couple of people and, uh, she told me not to do it again or she was going to turn me into the police. Um, that, oh, I couldn't tell you, 2008, I think. Um, and then, uh, 2011, when I decided to stop killing, my friend, I told her what I'd been doing and that I had stopped. And then, um, I told my pastor, and then after that, I told the, in 2014, um, after I passed away, I uh, went on a holiday, and, uh, that's when I really decided that this had to stop. And so, um, I told, um, a friend who lives in BC, um, then, uh, I told, when I came back, I got a from a lawyer. And then while I was in the Toronto, well, I was in Cam H, well, I told my friend, before everyone, I've told my cousin, I told my friend, and I told my friend, and then while I was in Cam H, I told um, someone who I thought was a friend. They turned around and called the police to make sure that it had really been dealt with. And I understand that he thought he was doing the right thing. I understand that, but he had said, oh, I won't tell anybody. And I was using him as a resource for support, and he turned around. And when I was, when I'd already, you know, I'd already shared it. So why would he call the police? So why do you think that none of these people confronted police? Maybe they didn't believe me. I don't know. Maybe they just thought, maybe they thought I was doing more something than the patient wanted done. You know? And as far as believing you, are these close people to you that you've shared other deep, dark secrets with maybe over time? That I, I would say deep, dark secrets with lots of stuff, yeah. Because this is a pretty serious thing. Yes, it is. It's right. horrible. I'm telling you. It's the worst thing. Although stated already, it's worth noting again that Elizabeth Wetlawfer's first victim to die from insulin overdose was in 2007, and she finally came forward with her own written confession and in police interview in 2016, nearly 10 years later.
Within that span of almost a decade, Wet Lawfer told multiple people about her crimes. Friends, her pastor, even a lawyer who advised her not to mention it to police. It's very likely she would have not been caught for a long time, if at all, had she not decided to come forward on her own. Sit tight for a few moments, okay. and I'll uh, be back to you shortly, okay? Again, on my uh, phone, I've got 739. Okay. Yeah. And uh, let me get back with uh, some answers and okay. where we want from here, okay? I'd like to go home. Okay. We'll sit tight and we'll, we'll see what's going on. Yeah, I have to wear anything for but I'd like to go home. Okay. All right. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Can someone cut these off with me now? Yeah, we'll get something to get those off. Okay. Yeah, I'll be right back. After this, Wetlawfer sits alone in the interrogation room for 20 minutes before the investigator comes back into the room to obtain some extra information, such as more detailed work history, going over the names of the individuals who she confessed to over the years, and to reiterate to her that at this time she is not under arrest as most of the information she's giving them is still under investigation, and she'll most likely be able to return home for the time being, albeit with an A-10 peace bond court document that puts restrictions on her while the case is still under investigation. Wetlawfer was formally charged with eight counts of murder on October 25th. I think she's sick. Literally sick. She needs help. She's a sick person, and she's lost in this world. And she made a lot of families in pain for the rest of their lives. I just picture my dad. I'm just... I'm just picturing my father as her patient and what he went through and how he couldn't talk and how he couldn't say help and how nobody cared and how he lied in that bed and had to die with nobody there. It's like you're drowning and nobody can give you a, a life raft. That's what my dad went through. And now I went through torture because I can't say anything to this individual and I cannot do anything. So this is even worse sometimes, I think. We um, got a call in the middle of the night um, that uh, he was declining and uh, we proceeded to the nursing home to arrive to him fighting her off literally physically fighting her off. She was in the room. And uh, we, uh, when we came in, she left abruptly. So, and a short time later, she came in again and uh, things happened. And uh, we uh, lost Mo within about a half an hour, 45 minutes of that. She administered the drug right in front of you, yes, didn't she? Yes, yes, she did. Absolutely no remorse whatsoever. You know, she's just there and she's going to go through it uh, and I don't see any remorse whatsoever. Upon further investigation on January 13th, 2017, she had additional charges of four counts of aggravated murder and two counts of aggravated assault. Her job was to care for the elderly and comfort the ill, but former nurse Elizabeth Wetlaufer is now one of Canada's worst serial killers. Today, the 49-year-old admitted she was consumed with anger, taking it out on helpless patients like James Silcox. The victim's families will get their chance to confront Wetlawfer directly when she's sentenced here later this month. She's facing life with no chance of parole for 25 years. But as one police officer noted today, this investigation was only sparked because of her confessions. She could have taken her secrets to the grave. She then waived her right to a preliminary hearing, which would have discussed whether there was enough evidence to support going to trial at all, and instead pleaded guilty to all charges on June 1st. Later that same month, she was sentenced to eight concurrent life terms in prison with no possibility of parole for 25 years. So now think of another title. Serial Killer. When that title comes to your mind, what do you think of? The smooth-talking, charismatic predator who would lure and then assault and strangle his victims like Ted Bundy? The creepy, careful and deadly Dennis Rader who would sneak into his victims' homes at gunpoint to torture and kill them? or the terrifying Richard Ramirez, who would watch and stalk his victims as they moved around in their own homes. Or maybe this woman, Elizabeth Wetlaufer, who on the surface appeared to be a caring nurse, healthcare professional. 
someone who would be regarded as an everyday hero, someone who would be entrusted with the care of our loved ones in their twilight years. But below the surface bubbled an urge to kill that drove her to commit wicked deeds, uncaught for years. In fact, as many news outlets speculate, if she hadn't come forward in the manner that she did, she possibly would never have been caught. Wetlawfer currently resides in an undisclosed psychiatric hospital where she's undergoing medical treatment and psychological evaluations. 